Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Deputy President. <clears throat> we shouldn't uh, continue to focus on conspiracy theories uh, and fringe theories. Uh, I don't think the thousands of Australians injured by the COVID vaccine would take too kindly to that disrespectful remark there by Senator Urquhart and the Labor Party. Vaccine injuries are not a conspiracy theory. Uh, and it is this reason why we need. I, I, I'm actually ambivalent about a COVID 19 and quite a Royal Commission into it because, quite frankly, I don't trust the judiciary uh, and they don't have the knowledge around the biochemistry of the vaccine. Um, but what I do want out of this process is that I want accountability. And I want the people that made these decisions and I want the people who gaslight the injured people to be held account because I am sick and tired of these people being mocked by people in this chamber, the other chamber, the media, the health authorities, and mocking people who follow the government advice in good faith and then have been trampled on and gaslighted because it doesn't suit their political agenda. And that is absolutely shameful. That is absolutely shameful. And to think that came from a Labor senator who's on the actual Community Affairs Committee that covers the health portfolio, that they should get up here and refer to these people as conspiracy theorists, is an absolute disgrace. And that is the nub of this issue, is the fact that government and democracy, democratic governments, are all about holding people to account. Democracy, as the great patriots in 1776 fought for, was to upturn the establishment, and no longer would we have the ruling elite destroy the, destroy the individual. And yet what we've got here is a complete gaslighting, a complete gaslighting of what happened in COVID-19. And of course, it's not just the vaccine injuries that we need to look into. We need to look into the whole sorry saga, the whole sorry saga. And I will slightly disagree with that, Senator Hanson. I, I don't want the judiciary involved. I actually went to the Supreme Court and sat in the Supreme Court uh, when the police, uh, those brave police officers, actually stood up for their own rights. And I listened to a judge say that he didn't want to understand the biochemistry of the vaccine. He didn't want to understand the biochemistry of it. Well, if you don't actually understand how the thing works, how on earth can you possibly rule on it? And that's where the nub of this issue goes to, is how we need to actually understand how respiratory infections work. We need to understand pathogens because there's different types of pathogens. And I'll touch on that now because I've got 15 minutes to speak. So it's very important that you understand there is a different, you have different types of pathogens. You have bacteria, you have double-stranded DNA viruses, and you have single-stranded mRNA viruses. Okay, your bacteria is generally dealt with by the use of antibiotics. And one of the reasons why we haven't had severe pandemics in the last 100 years is thanks to those great scientists like Fleming and Flory, who discovered penicillin and have effectively been able to use antibiotics to control the spread of bacteria. And that is an issue that we need to look at here uh, is why azithromycin, which was a widely used uh, antibiotic, was actually by the COVID-19 ev COVID Evidence Task Force why they recommended against using this widely used uh, antibiotic for people who had COVID. Because if you actually understand uh, respiratory infections, you might initially catch uh, a viral infection, but if for older people or, or vulnerable people, they will get a bacterial infection. And yet we had a situation there, and this is another thing that needs to be looked at, were the lockdowns in Victoria in 2020, August 2020, that led to about 800 deaths in aged care centres. Why were those people locked down in aged care centres when they should have been put in hospital? That's something that hasn't been looked at at all, because aged care centres weren't equipped to deal with people who had COVID. Those people should have been put to, sent to hospital. And was that deliberate by the uh, then Premier to make sure that if they went to hospital it didn't become his responsibility? Was it all too politically convenient to let them die in aged care centres so that the state government of Victoria could blame the federal government, uh, which was a Liberal government? 
because the other thing that needs to, you know, I'll say the other thing, one of many things that needs to be looked at is the politicisation of health. And we saw it with the premiers every day who would get up there and perform their stunts like clowns in the media circus, terrifying people about the risks of that virus. <clears throat> a virus which, mind you, uh, I accept, was a risk to older people and people uh, with vulnerabilities, comorbidities. All viruses are, but it's how you react to these things that matter. It's how you handle these issues. And locking down healthy people of working age population was completely unnecessary. You don't destroy the strong to protect the weak. But yet that's exactly what happened here, because we know that the Labor government could never accept that they lost the 2019 election. And we all know that in politics, that Labor are generally considered to be more trusted with health and education. The Liberals and the Coalition are generally uh, considered to be more trusted with defence and the economy and law and order. So Labor played on their strengths. They knew that they could terrify everyone, lock everyone down with their repeated propaganda. And that's what it was. It was nothing but propaganda, those daily press conferences. Ooh, there's COVID in the sewerage. There's COVID in the sewerage. Or Dan Andrews, if you don't take this vaccine, you're going to be lining up for a machine that helps you breathe. What type of hysterical hyperbole is that? That's not medical advice. That's not medical advice. That is unashamed and unabashed propaganda used to exploit people who didn't understand what we were dealing with. Now, I mean, some people, and you know, I, I have to deal with these people as well, don't think, they think the whole virus thing's uh, not real. I disagree with that. I think viruses are real, they're genuine, and they need to be dealt with. But you do not. The fact of the matter is, is that most people could have coped with it. Okay? And we did not need to lock down. Now, the other thing we really need to address when we look at this whole handling of the COVID pandemic was the actual PCR testing. There are two issues with the PCR testing. One was that the cycle threshold was set at 40. So that would pick up anything, any sort of dead virus in your body, that if you'd had a virus from years gone by and any part of that was left in your body, that could pick it up. But the other thing, and this is what really annoys me, is that we cannot get the primers or the genetic sequence that was used in that PCR testing to actually find out what the PCR testing said was COVID. So we know that COVID was 29, uh, a virus with 29 proteins of about 1,200 nucleotides in each protein. We know the sequence of COVID. What, what have I asked for in the T, uh, from the TGA, and they won't give it to me because it's commercial in confidence, is the primer used in that PCR test to distinguish, uh, to determine whether or not that PCR test could distinguish between COVID and other forms of viruses, whether it be influenza A, B, or whatever. You know, and it was interesting when the Olympics was on. I noticed that everyone, you know, people had COVID. They didn't have the flu; they had COVID. And this is really, really important because, as we just heard Senator Urquhart say, there's going to be more uh, waves of COVID. Really? Well, that's nothing new in that. We've had waves of viruses for thousands of years. Ever since man started domesticate animals, uh, we've been catching viruses from animals and, and sharing it amongst animals and humans and whatever through uh, contact for thousands of years. This is nothing new. What is new, however, is the level of propaganda and organised global propaganda by a concentrated media that has access through technology into all of our phones very easily. So once upon a time, I remember growing up, you might listen to the news once in the morning or you're on the radio and you might have a news bulletin at seven o'clock at night and you may have to go, and if you wanted to get the newspaper, you'd have to go up, get the newspaper and that'd be it. Today's technology allows news to be streamed to you every second of the day. And so that message can be constantly repeated. And we saw that yet again here in Australia. I mean, I know Clive Palmer rang me. He, he uh, wanted me to join his party early on when I withheld my vote. But he did tell me that when he tried to put out advertisements uh, to warn against the vaccine, he was told that no one, 
no, no media would actually put those advertisements out. No media would put those advertisements out because if they did that, the government said that we will not give you any media advertising. Now that was an absolute disgrace. That was an absolute disgrace. And it raises the question, is our media too concentrated in this country? And I think it is. I think it was the Morrison government that actually abolished the cross-media ownership laws in this country. Well, we need to bring the cross-media ownership laws back and we need to break up the monopoly of basically the Murdoch press, the ABC press and the Nine Fairfax press, because those three media organisations control probably, I'm guessing, 80 per cent of the mainstream media. And there is very, very little room to have a contrasting opinion, and if you do, heaven forbid, you get shut down. You get shut down. So we need to have a look at that. We need to look at the excess deaths yet again. You know, we heard Senator Urquhart say the vaccine saved lives. I, I'd like to know. I'd really like to know how you work that out, because unless you're doing autopsies on all those deaths, unless you're getting tissue samples. Unless you're looking for the presence of the spike protein, and the spike protein from the vaccine is different to the spike protein in the virus, there's a proline insertion at 986 and 987 proline amino acid insertion there that will tell you very quickly if there's a uh, vaccine uh, proteins are hanging around in the body causing damage. And then we've got the lipids, four different lipids, despite what Senator, uh, sorry, not Senator. Uh, Professor, adjunct professor, not a real professor, adjunct professor, Skerritt told me uh, in estimates that the lipids are nothing more than dietary lipids that you eat on your steak or sausage. They're not. They were actually lipids designed to cross the cell membrane of any cell. Now, the virus couldn't do that. It could only cross the membrane of the cell with an ACE receptor. And here's the thing. The spleen and the bone marrow don't have ACE receptors. Those two organs are very important because they produce your white blood cells. You start messing around with the organs that produce the white blood cells to protect your immune system, you're playing with fire. But yet this vaccine used a process called transfection, and this was the first medicine to ever be used that could cross the cell membrane, go inside your cell, and the ribosomes would start processing a new pathogen based on whatever was in that mRNA code. So we really need to have a much uh, further investigation of that. And this is, this is the thing when they say it saved lives or whatever. I actually think the lockdowns early on probably did save lives for what it's worth. I'm, I'm not disputing that. But was at the cost-benefit analysis of what? We went from 164,000 deaths in 2019 to 162,000 deaths in 2020. Sure, so 2,000 people less died in 2020 because of the lockdowns. Right? But then in 2021, we had an extra 10,000 deaths. So what caused that? Because COVID wasn't in the community in 2021. Now, maybe that was uh, a bit of a blowback from the fact that we had delayed uh, or deferred medical checkups. So I think that's entirely uh, uh, plausible. Uh, but to have an extra 10,000 deaths in eight months, that was a spike of 10 per cent. And those deaths jumped the very first month after the vaccine rollout occurred. For these guys to gaslight those figures as being not related to the vaccine is absurd, especially when COVID wasn't in the community. It's much harder in 2022 when you had an extra 30,000 deaths. Right, sure, COVID was in the community. What was COVID? What was the vaccines? We don't know. Even though I suspect it was probably both. But 2021, you had a very, and Australia is very unique like that, in the sense because we stayed locked down for so long. And then, of course, we need to look at, you know, those border lockdowns, because we had thousands of people in my home state, Queenslanders, locked out of Queensland, living in tents in Mwilumba, uh and, and places or living in the back of their car. My office was bombarded with people who couldn't pay their ho hotel bills. They got caught out. They had bills of $10,000. They couldn't get to work. They had pets uh, locked up in the houses. And most importantly, they couldn't see their loved ones. They couldn't see their loved ones. I've got a very close friend who herself was in this chamber once upon a time who couldn't be there when her sister died. Who couldn't be there when her sister died because you guys stopped that from happening. And that's disgraceful. That is absolutely disgraceful. So we need, I, I don't care what sort of inquiry it is, I mean, we can have, we need to get real and we need to hold the people to account 
that cause so much unnecessary suffering to Australians. Authorised G. Rennick People First Chermside.